I'm an underwater archaeologist based in the University of Nottingham. Um, and I was placed with The Times uh, to work as a science journalist um, for three weeks, which was, you know, a really exciting opportunity for me. I really wanted to do the British Science Association uh, Media Fellowship because really I'm interested in talking about what I do. That's why I got into being a lecturer in the first place and why I became an academic. Um, and one of the things about academia is you actually become more and more specialised in the area you're doing and you become more and more removed actually from the people sometimes. I think one of the really important things about this fellowship is you actually get into a media organisation and you start working properly alongside media professionals and you get to know them. Um, and then you've actually got those contacts. A lot of these people are incredibly busy um, and you know are sent things, unsolicited emails all, all the time and those tend not to be dealt with I would say. But if they already know you and you know the person, then that's a good uh, contact to have. Um, so it really is a way in, a way in ahead of the crowd in some ways. It's certainly not, and I want to be clear about this, it's not an internship. Um, you know, you're actually doing the job. From day one, you're given a story, or if you're working for the, 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 the broadcast media side, you're, you're given a, a project, and you're working on it alongside the professionals, and you have to pick it up pretty quickly. So, you know, that's, that's not an experience you would get every day. The day starts about eight o'clock over your breakfast because the science journalists start uh, emailing and tweeting each other um, about the stories of the day because they start to look at what's coming up on, the, there's a news network called Eureka Alerts where a lot of the big science stories come up and equally, you know, they might be getting other things from other outlets, it might be universities getting in touch with them. So we'll begin to talk about which stories we want to pitch to the actual news editor because the news editor will go in at 10 o'clock um, to the conference um, which will decide the content of the newspaper for that day. You suddenly you've got real deadlines and obviously as, a, as an academic having a, a real deadline i.e. five o'clock today we want your work in uh, was something new and that was something I wanted to do just to sort of sharpen up in my writing skills and you know basically see if I could do it. Okay so this is the first story that I did um, and you know first day you're just giving it get on with it and it was about a flower that uh, pollinated underwater. The first ever flower pollinates underwater. Very exciting, but hard to make that exciting in the first line. So what we did was we brought dinosaurs into it and um, we had this idea that the plant was pollinating underwater and the dinosaurs were unaware of it. Then that goes into the um, headline and this actually got picked up by a few other news agencies who again <laughs> concentrated on the fact that dinosaurs were eating it. We have no evidence that dinosaurs were eating it. I was just saying that dinosaurs were near it when it was happening. But anyway, um, that's one of the lessons is kind of having that first line that brings people into the story and it's easier in some stories than others. Obviously with archaeology stories you can talk about the discovery, you can talk about the initial you know, excitement of that, that brings people in, they want to know more. But the general kind of stories, we did a lot of um, health stories, science and health tend to kind of cross over quite a lot. I did a lot of stuff about aspirin, a lot of stuff about bowel cancer strangely enough. Um, and a lot of stuff about toddlers and uh, intelligence and all this kind of thing. And this, the, 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 the science stories are kind of harder to, to you know, you, you tend to just report them. So your first line basically says what the story is. Taking a low dose of aspirin or ibuprofen helps to prevent cancer. That's it. That's what the story is about. Bit more information, um, what the, the report was saying, then who did it, and then you get into your quotes. And that's really it. So you're kind of top loading the story. There's an assumption that people will only perhaps read the first two, two, two paragraphs of your story. And this one's about Stonehenge, up your street. Yeah, so Stonehenge, to try and bring people into Stonehenge, we decided to start off, there was a discovery of a, of a, of a massive superhenge near Stonehenge, and we decided to say, okay, most people driving along the A345 would be completely unaware that they were driving through one of the biggest archaeological monuments in Britain and then start talking about it. Rather than saying straight off what it is and what it is you've found, it's just trying to bring people in with that first line. And you have to live with the headlines, don't you? Because you weren't happy with this one. Well, it's difficult because you, you don't really have a control over the headlines. And this one was about um, Antikythera. It's a, um, a Roman wreck um, that's being excavated at the moment. Um, and it's the idea that there's this daring dive, that everything has to be risky and difficult in underwater archaeology. And that's something I'm always trying to get away from. OK, it can be exciting. But look, we're not risking our lives every single time we go in the water. Otherwise, I wouldn't go. I had some, some academics who got in touch with me while I was working at the time saying, when are you going to get back to some proper research and stop playing around at being a journalist? Um, and the thing that really struck me about this and why I wanted to do it was the amount of people you reach. Um, 
I wrote uh, an article for the BBC News website a few years ago, and it was downloaded over that weekend 300,000 times. It was the third biggest uh, news story that weekend. Um, and that was just absolutely amazing to me as an archaeologist, as, a, as an academic. Normally, academic books will have a print run of about 600, if it's a good print run. If it does really well and goes into paperback, you might get another 600. 1,200 people, well, 1,200 books are published. Um, but with something like, you know, obviously um, publishing in a newspaper or in a magazine, you're suddenly reaching thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in some cases. And that's really important because it's a chance to talk about your subject um, and get support for your subject. Because a lot of people, you know, will say um, um, you're only talking about it in a very dumbed down way or you're talking about it in a very basic way. And I think that's really unfair. You're not doing that. You're talking about it in an understandable way, in a way that's relevant to people's lives. Um, and that can have an impact because they're more likely to think what you do is important if they hear about it. If they don't hear about it, they're unlikely to think it's important and unlikely to care if funding gets cut for it, for example. And equally, if there's not public support for something, governments are unlikely to care if funding gets cut for something. I mean, at the end of the day, politicians are interested in votes. And if a lot of people are excited by something and care about it, then it's more likely that politicians will care for it too. So I think in terms of the future of archaeology, in terms of the future of the arts and the sciences, I think, you know, Public communication is key. Um, and I really like the idea of academics being involved in that and being empowered in it and not being, um, you know, afraid of it or worried that their message will be changed, you know, and obfuscated into something else. Because my impression was very much that doesn't happen. Um, certainly at the, at the times, the science journalists were very keen to make sure the facts were correct and very interested in the science. And if the science was bad, then they wouldn't publish it. It wasn't a case of big headlines went over good science. They were trying to report things in an understandable way. I think the value for an academic doing this fellowship is seeing it from the other side, is seeing it from the point of view of the science journalist. Um, and I came out of it with a lot of respect for science journalists. The way that these guys would write is just an entirely different way from the way that I would normally do things. Um, and they would take a sentence that I put way down in the fourth paragraph and put that right up as the first sentence because it would actually encapsulate the story. Um, you know, you don't tend to do that in academia, you tend to build things up, you don't tend to blow all your guns at once, as it were. Um, but that's what you do in the news, you say, bang, this is what we're doing.